afternoon, everybody. Um, at least the rain is over, thank goodness. <laughs> anyway, I'm uh, very honored to be here, especially with an incredible panel. Um, everybody here has written a um, wonderful book about Katrina and some of the lessons that were learned and some of the um, what the impact was of trying to recover from uh, Katrina. And I'm going to actually mention everybody's book. Uh, so since that's why we're here, Roberta's, I think, must get, you must get an award for the best title, which is, We're Still Here, You Bastards, How the People of New Orleans Rebuilt Their City. Uh, the General, now he's, he's written a book about leadership, which of course, as most of you probably know, he led the Defense Department's response to Hurricane Katrina. And he's since retired, and he wrote a book about leadership called Leadership in the New Normal. Uh, Andy Horowitz. Uh, is an assistant professor of history at Tulane, and his book was, is Katrina, a History, 1915 to 2015, and it won a Bancroft Prize for History, American History. And he will explain, I'm sure, why he has a 100-year span just to talk about Katrina. And then uh, Sandy Rosenthal is next. She's the founder of Levies.org, which was a grassroots organization formed after Hurricane Katrina uh, to f uncover the truth about who caused the levees to fail, an effort that she recounts in her book, Words Whispered in Water. And last but not least, we have Mark Van Landingham, professor at Tulane School of Public Health. He also directs the Center for Studies of Displaced Populations. His book is called Weathering Katrina and explores Katrina's impact on the city's Vietnamese immigrant community and their recovery. So one of the reasons we're talking about Katrina 17 years after uh, the storm is because, well, one, I guess people are still recovering in many ways from the storm, but also we live in a world where other communities face the prospect, especially with climate change, of maybe similar disasters. So I want to start out by asking each of the panelists what, you know, from the, your extensive work looking at the storm and the aftermath, what would you say are the most important things that you learned that you think might be helpful for other communities um, who, that face a similar type crisis. You want me? To yeah, start? why don't you start? Um, well, I've prepared. I've prepared some remarks because I think there's good news and there's bad news, and everybody can learn from both. An uptown power broker after Katrina went on the air to declare the city would be smaller, whiter, and richer. Well, that's happened. Over 100,000 people have not returned, mostly black, and a small number of people have come, mostly white. The city functions no better than it did before Katrina, and if anything, it might be worse. Broken streets, appalling garbage collection, lack of street signs, rising house costs, both for rent and for sale, unenforced short-term rental rules. The problems are out of control. What makes it even worse is that the city still receives a pitiful fraction of the hotel sales tax. The lion's share goes to the state and to public authorities controlled by the same cabal of ins and insiders. Schools are a mess, student achievements embarrassing, and for this, the school board decimated the black middle class of this city when it fired this teach, all the teachers after Katrina, 7,000 of them. So many of those teachers and other white collar black professionals found new jobs in cities thrilled to have them. As, as for climate resilience, after Katrina, there were very creative ideas developed that the city could do to live with water. Implementation has been a drop in the bucket. Then there was the destruction of the well-functioning, diverse, mid-city neighborhood and the closing of the historic charity hospital. What for? 
So LSU could build a smaller hospital, some beds of which are not even used today, on an enormous plot of land that leaves room for LSU to develop in the future. But there is good news. The community-based energy that, as I show in my book, did the hard work of rebuilding this city after Katrina survives. The best example of this continued success is currently the diversified resistance and citizen-based pushback of the biodistrict proposal that could only be seen as the art of the steel. The local opposition has beaten back a number of the biodistrict proposals and has shown that the biodistrict is still nothing more than an old-fashioned New Orleans project to divert limited public funds and avoid city regulation. But now, because of smart community organizing, the biodistrict's promoters' expectations have been considerably diminished. The desired expropriation power is eliminated. The boundaries are changed to spare residential areas. City council approval is required for fu future plans. All city ordinances and regulations must be followed and more. Okay. That fight is ongoing. One more minute. Okay. <laughs> but was almost lost as the city council was on the verge of supporting it before citizens rose up. Then there's the massive public outcry that stopped the mayor from moving the city hall to the municipal auditorium so city hall could be demolished with the goal, a hotel to benefit the Benson family. Oh yes, the attempt to make the French Quarter pedestrian only was beaten back. The balance sheet on good news, bad news is still lopsided in favor of the power elite but at least the pushback power New Orleanians exhibited after Katrina hasn't disappeared. Thank you. So, General. Uh, I think we can go to questions. That was pretty dynamic. <laughs> 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 Katrina was not a one-off. Uh, our coastline was, uh, had the impact of man-made pollution that destroyed our wetlands uh, through exploration canals, that took away some of our buffer. But it was not a one-off. Matter of fact, we've had like four or five Katrinas in the last five years, if you count Lake Charles and uh, the other storms. Uh, it proves that anything built by man can be broken by Mother Nature. And when Katrina came, our infrastructure was old. It wasn't well maintained. And I don't know what they did with the money after Katrina, other than put the levy up. Uh, but we still not maintain our infrastructure. I clearly agree with the previous speaker that uh, the way the city is run, speaking specifically in New Orleans, is ridiculous. Uh, the Saints get as much money from hotel tax as the city of New Orleans. That's a crying damn shame. But we like our saints. Uh, but you, your schools and your police force is not big enough. We learned all that in Katrina. So I'm done with that. So, so do, you, do you think there are lessons to be learned? Yeah, uh, many of them bad. <laughs> of how not to do something when the federal government come in uh, with some high hitting senator out of uh, DC and said, hey, you ought to change your schools. You ought to do like we did up north. And, and go all private charter schools. Some of the schools you don't even know what it is. What's happening now school? Have no legacy, have no history. Uh, it's ridiculous. It's almost like after post reconstruction, but people who should have known better came in and for economic reason, destroyed a system that was struggling, but what they needed was money, not uh, a total revolution of how we educate children because we destroyed a middle class, a black middle class. Thank you. So Andy, you looked at the whole 100 year <laughs> before and after yeah, Katrina. I'll, Any lessons? Um, I'll, I'll make As two, we go into the future. Yeah, I'll make, I'll make two points um, <laughs> as quickly as I can. The first is that Russell Honore should run for governor of Louisiana. <laughs> 
take the mask. And the second, the second is that um, these extreme weather events, that, like Hurricane Katrina, or Hurricane Ida, th those may be inevitable, but the disasters that we come to associate with them are not. And we just see that again and again, that it's within the realm of human control. You can look on a very small scale. Uh, every hurricane casualty is preventable because we know in advance the storm is coming and we certainly have the means to get people out of town or put them in a safe uh, and se secure shelter. And the reason we don't is not because the storms overwhelm us, but because we have an insufficient commitment to the protection and preservation of human life. That's the problem with a hurricane casualty. And writ large, we can look at the history of the city you know, in the, in the 10, 15, coming on 20 years after the flood. And, you know, if you look, for example, as I do in my book at the history of the Lower Ninth Ward versus the history of Lakeview, people from New Orleans know these neighborhoods. Lakeview, 10,000 white people, upper middle class. Uh, Lower Ninth Ward, 10,000 black people, working class. They both saw 10 feet of water. But 10 years after the storm, Lakeview, nearly everybody was back, and the Lower Ninth, fewer than half the people were back. That's not a consequence of the water. That's because of uh, social arrangements before the flood and the political policies that were promulgated after the flood, largely in the name of recovery and resilience. Uh, you can read that as a very optimistic story about what we can control or a very pessimistic story about what we refuse to or with the, you know, the things that we try to make happen. Um, so anyway, that's, 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 I think, the big lesson is how much control and power we actually have if we engage with the politics of these events. Thank you. And also, uh, Governor. Yeah. <laughs> well, as, uh, the gov as the general, the, 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 yeah, the governor. governor. We're going to will it into being here. <laughs> we really have a lot of votes here. <laughs> as a future governor, and, and both Andy has already alluded to, that um, this shorthand of Katrina means much more than a hurricane that, that formed out in, in the ocean 17 years ago. When we talk about Katrina now, we are really talking, well, in, in, in what my focus was, that this was not a storm, the, the catastrophe was not anything that the people here did or did not do, and certainly not anything about the geography of the city. It was a catastrophic engineering failure on the part of the federal government. And that same federal government spent millions upon millions hiding that from the American people. So if you were old enough to watch television in 2005, you watched this disaster unfold. You saw the people on their roofs. You saw the flooding. But I am certain that 99.9% .9 of those same people don't really know the facts. And that's why I wrote a book, Words Whispered in Water, Why the Levees Broke During Hurricane Katrina. I never used the word Katrina once in my entire book. The only reason it's on the cover is because my publisher insisted on it. <laughs> so I had to go with that. But, but um, the big lesson learned that I, focus, that I focus on is beware the information you are provided in the days, weeks, and months after a storm because, uh, excuse me, after a disaster of, of any sort because it will be years before that full information comes through. Mm -hmm. Mark. The first thing I'll say is, is, is uh, what an honor it is to be on a panel like this, you know, with um, the, the, my esteemed um, panelists and big fans of everybody um, up here, especially this one. When, when I was reading Sandy's book, I kept thinking of this saying by Margaret Mead that goes along the lines of, <laughs> never underestimate the power of a small group of citizens to affect fundamental social change. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. Mm -hmm. Her, uh, Sandy's book is just absolutely fantastic. It's a great story about how she did go up against the Goliaths, you know, who were kind of really kind of declaring it's dead, you know, and, and, and you know, we're not willing to put in any resources up there. And thank you from the bottom of my heart for leading such a, such a su successful um, effort. I, I have a tremendous admiration for you and, and, and that group. As, as, as for me, uh, what got me interested in Katrina was living through it. And then at the time I happened to, I'm, I'm interested, I'm, I'm an immigration scholar, so I was really interested in this Vietnamese community. Um, New Orleans has a, it was one of the first Vietnamese communities to be established after the, the collapse of South Vietnam and is, you know, doing a study of how they fare in America compared to their counterparts back home. And once um, Katrina happened and I kind of dried myself off and kind of figured out what, you know, what I was going to do next, I realized that um, I'd just done a wave of data collection right before the storm happened. And I realized that, oh, I could have a longitudinal before and after study and kind of see how they, um, how they did you know, move, moving forward. Short answer to that is 
surprisingly well, um, especially as I kind of look through the disaster literature and kind of, and especially the um, the literature on resilience. And, and there's a big focus on kind of the I guess fundamental takeaway is people who are doing well before a disaster do well afterwards. Good begets good, bad begets bad. And what some of these resources are, some of them are pretty obvious. Economic capital, money, social capital, connections, human capital, um, education and skills. But when I was looking at the, at the Vietnamese, once it became really clear that they were doing extremely well on all the kind of major outcomes, percent coming back, mental health, physical health, um, um, employment, all these things that were doing surprisingly well in spite of the fact that they didn't really have a lot of economic capital, social capital, or human capital. You know, they were, they're, they're actually pretty modest in all of those. And so as I kind of started thinking about, you know, how to make sense of that, it finally dawned on me that, well, you big dummy, what distinguishes them is that they're Vietnamese. You know, that, that, that you know, they're kind of just like everybody, all of their neighbors, except they inherit what is often neglected in the literature that some people call cultural capital. They, they, they've learned a lot from generation through generation about views of how the world works and kind of stories that they tell each other about who they are and how the stories work that put them in really good stead, you know, for moving forward after Katrina, in spite of the fact that they weren't very well endowed in any of these other, uh, in, in these other types of assets that people in disaster literature, um, you know, focus on. I'll give you uh, just a couple of quick examples and then I'll, I promise to stop because we could all, we could all spend an hour <laughs> on, on, on each of these books. So one example is um, 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 social scientists refer to these kind of lenses or frames of viewing the world and one, one that, um, um, I kind of um, um, jumped out at me from the Vietnamese is um, th there's this frame of hierarchy, you know, so most of us in New Orleans after Katrina where we're trying to find our way, no, you had too many um, uh, chiefs and not, not enough Indians, you know, everybody, everybody wanted to develop their own neighborhood or do, or do their own thing, nobody would fall into line, but in the Vietnamese community there's this real appreciation and acceptance of hierarchy. You might not agree with what the elder or the, or the, or the priest or the community leader says, but once that is, after everybody argues about it, you fall into line and then you do it. You know? So that, that put them in, not saying that, that hierarchy is a frame that everybody should follow, but it, it certainly worked well um, for, for them. And then there are these kind of stories, these narratives that they kind of pass along to each other about who they are. And one that jumped out to me was this, this story of survival. You know, so there, there were people who had, in 1954, when Vietnam had split into um, the communist north and the capitalist south, a lot of the capitalists, or a lot of the Catholics moved to the south. They had to get, give up everything and, kind of, and restart again. And then when South Vietnam fell and the communists won, they had to pick up and start, and start over again. So Katrina was just kind of another chapter of this. Things kind of fall apart we brush ourselves off and we move forward again. And so they're, they're, they're these kind of stories that they tell about who they are. So those, those were some things that, you know, that, that I learned. I'm not sure how much of it is necessarily transferable you know, to, 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 to other, well, uh, other groups, but I found it interesting. I mean, it seems to me that all five of you are saying that if there's any lesson, it's that the change and the recovery is going to come from the ground up. And that, I don't know, tell me if I'm wrong, that maybe it's better if the government just kind of leave people to their own, you know, that, you know, to, to you know, support them. But that's where the recovery comes from, is from the grassroots. That's a great question. If you don't, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll keep the ball and kind of send, send, it, send it back down. That okay, line. sure. Is that, is that okay? So, I don't think, I mean, that, that, that would be kind of a natural conclusion, but I don't think so. You know, so, and I think that's kind of one conclusion that a lot of people have made from looking at the Vietnamese is that you can have a kind of a do-it-yourself recovery, you know, and you don't really need government kind of stepping in. But I think that's the wrong conclusion because in, in the Vietnamese case, they actually had a lot of resources to help them move forward. Not financial or, or, or skills necessarily, but other types of resources that other groups do not have. And so I think that government really does play a really important role for groups that are much less advantaged than, than, than the Vietnamese okay. and should direct their resources there. And if I may grab it, the the uh, the failure of the levy system in New Orleans, which caused the catastrophe, was um, federal. It was built by the federal government. So certainly the federal government should come in, not only rebuild that system, which they did, but also they should have provided a lot more support and, and infrastructure and, and help 
which they did not. I mean, that, and that's a whole other story. Uh, why they did not, mainly because uh, the Army Corps of Engineers was found immune from liability um, by the Flood Control Act of 1928 which made it really rough for the people uh, who live here in New Orleans. But I would agree that no, no, we, we shouldn't. Uh, uh, the pull yourselves up by your own bootstraps uh, uh, phenomenon is not something I would recommend. Okay, uh, I, think, um, I think about it this way. The local little organizations that we make together the Social Aid and Pleasure Club, the church, the book club, those beautiful, fluorescent, virtuosic things that New Orleans excels at is what makes life worth living. But we desperately need government to make life possible. There's no local glass, grassroots solution to uh, building the levy system that we need, not the one we have, the one we need. We don't want to leave the, our fates up to the free market, uh, even, even if we have our nice little clubs on the side. So. Um, Yes, I just will, by way of agreeing, we desperately, the government, our organized federal government is the only institution in the world with the power to make the life that we want to live possible, and we desperately need it to be responsive to us. But, but it almost sounds a little bit more like, but, but they should listen, the government should listen to what the local people are asking for. Yes, I'm coming out in favor of very good, very powerful government. How about right, that? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we, uh, we need a FEMA to bring food and water and set up temporary places, as well as to help doing, provide resources during pandemics. Uh, but we need to rework government. And right now it takes FEMA from five to 10 years to recover a community. And it, they're not just dealing with the Gulf Coast, they're dealing with hurricanes. We need a recovery agency that is focused on rebuilding. FEMA, most of the people, and I have friends in there, but so take this with a shot of whiskey. <laughs> Their job is to tell you no. Right. The government spends so much money, your house probably got inspected four times. It is ridiculous. They don't know what they're doing because they're spending federal money on, uh, and they change them out about every 90 days, so you might have dealt with about five different FEMA people. It is broke. It is worse than communism. They're so worried about you cheating the government that the little people don't get nothing because they'll give you $100,000 and spend $150,000 to make sure that that $100,000 they give you is correct. It is totally stupid. And every administration that put up with this. You know, we brought, uh, at the time of Katrina, said, well, that guy's slow. Then we brought a genius in. Then we brought a crazy man in. <laughs> then we brought another nice guy in. None of them get it. <laughs> Hurricane Laura, two years ago, still don't have money to rebuild public housing because the way they do it. The people who own the public housing, you get an estimate, it's gonna cost $300,000 to repair it, it goes in the bank. The person hire a contractor and they take it off. If you do everything right, you, you got a grant to rebuild your home. The way the government is doing it is totally stupid. So, yeah, well, what's the answer? <laughs> uh, I, I, redo the government. Um, I agree with everything you said. <laughs> I would say the idea of redoing the government is beyond the pale. What's needed is the government, A, has to listen to people and not just the elite, real people in their neighborhoods, in their homes. You know, one of the, the worst things about Katrina, one of the most unfair things, was when they went to uh, uh, reimburse people for the destruction of their homes. They valued those homes according to the value before Katrina. If your home was worth 175,000 before Katrina, 
and it was destroyed, it was going to cost you 300000 to replace it. This was a absolutely uh, wrong decision directed for the wrong, at the wrong people. So my feeling is that, uh, you know, and I've been writing about how cities recover for 50 years. The most successful ones that I have seen, the most successful elected officials, they follow their citizens. They don't override them. They see the train leading the station with the citizens at the, uh, at the engine. They get on the train. They don't start a new train or ignore the one that's starting. And uh, the idea of remaking an, uh, an institution in the government is so mind-boggling, you would spend the rest of your life on that. But if we can only get them to listen and not forge ahead or only direct their attention and their funding to the special class, it would make a big difference. So, so that's interesting because your book, you, you do deal a lot with what the local people are asking for and how some of them have to get around what the government is sort of directing from the top. So what, 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 what do you think the failure was? Because people seem very active, politically active in um, New Orleans. I mean, you have people like Sandy who was you know, out, out there trying to uncover the truth. Um, why were they ignored? Well, I wrote a whole book about this. <laughs> um, it's not uncommon to ignore the people who you should be helping the most. Um, it, it's not original to New Orleans. Uh, it just happened to be at a time when the people who needed the most help to recover were getting the least in terms of government response. And the money was going to all the wrong places. I mean, I have a couple of figures in my book that are just shocking each time I, I think about it. The blue tarps uh, that we saw on all the roofs. Um, a contractor would get money for this, had never done a roof in their lives. It didn't matter. So say $100,000 go to contractor A. That contractor, very well placed politically, you can be sure, uh, engages the next contractor, also inex inexperienced, for $75 a, a, a tarp. And that contractor just uh, engages a third contractor for maybe $50. Maybe that contractor actually hires someone on the ground to put up the roof for $5. The money all went in the wrong places. And the people who needed the most uh, uh, help were the most ignored. And it's not as if there weren't solutions. They were right there in front of their face and people showed, just um, made it perfectly clear what was needed. It's a matter of who gets listened to at a time of disaster. Mm -hmm. And it, after Katrina, all the wrong people. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting. I would like to hear one of the other panelists. Is it, do you think that part of that was the fact that people have been dispersed? Yeah, so it's many. called disaster capitalism. Right. Debris removal. Eight days into Katrina, mayor says, Gerald, I want you to move the debris. I said, well, I don't do that. I move people. <laughs> but the Corps engineer, if you ask them, they'll run the contract. On that day, we were moving debris out of the city at $9 a cubic. The mayor talked to the governor. They went to the Corps engineers, a good friend of the governor, Shaw Group, Bernhardt and gang got the contract for $16. They subcontracted, Shaw Group don't own a truck. The people that were moving it at the time they asked were local people who got their trucks running. People with three and four trucks. And they were doing all right. 
By the time Shaw got it, they paid subcontractor of $13. That subcontractor paid somebody else $12. Guess what trucks they hired? The same dudes that we had running the debris in the first place. It's called disaster capitalism. And they did nothing but sit in the office, ran computers, they got lawyers, they got PR firms, and they ripped the state and the federal government off. And then we had people come from Chicago and said, I'll put up a dump for you. A total group of gangsters, corrupt gangsters, put that dump up with the approval of the LDEQ. So uh, I'm probably providing you more information than you want to sleep with tonight, <laughs> but I'm just telling you, as soon as the wind stopped blowing, the corruption start. Uh -huh. right, so the people who came in were the contractors, all the, the residents were leaving, especially the poorer residents, right? right? right. And General, to use your word, it's a crying shame, <laughs> but, um, and the, the, the communities that are most harmed, you know, the, the poorer communities are most harmed by this. I will point out that after the, the disaster we call Katrina 17 years ago, huge changes were made in many ways. The, um, the National Flood Insurance Program understood how woefully unprepared they were. FEMA was completely changed, and uh, they, they realized, the federal government realized that many people refused to evacuate because they refused, they didn't want to leave their pets. And so they stayed and perished with their pets. I, 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 uh, it's, I, uh, I am a pet lover. But it's also that this, this rule was important because uh, this was for the people. You know, it was so that people would evacuate. And so changes were made that uh, states in this country cannot receive uh, assistance from FEMA unless they provide for pets in case of evacuation. So there have been, on the bright note, there have been many, many changes in federal laws uh, due to the disaster we call Katrina, but not enough. And unfortunately, there's changes are made immediately right after these disasters, and then seven, 17, 18, 20 years goes by, and it probably slides back to the way it was. Uh, Andy uh, talks in, in depth in his book, though, about how those communities uh, that are harmed the most are the uh, communities least able to handle it, uh, the, the poor communities. Thank you. I, I guess I'll just... Um, Thinking about these examples of, of debris removal and blue tarps, one could tell, and let's see if I can do it in 15 seconds, one could tell a different version of that story that says the other option was the government was going to come in and do it at cost and deprive all of those small businesses of the opportunity and put, put people out of business, take food off your table, because this is basically the socialist proposal. Now, I don't actually believe that, but I tell you that version of the story because that's the critique that brings in these levels of subcontract. That's what happens in the congressional hearing because we call it, and it's just so delightful to me that we got here in like 25 minutes in the business school, but we call it corruption, we <laughs> call it uh, inefficiency, it's called capitalism. And maybe I'll just quit while I'm ahead, but that's the system, <laughs> that's the system that uses private profit as the metric of success. So it's not that government as itself is so terrible. That is not actually the problem we've discovered. The problem is that when you try to run your government like a business and insist that every step of the way has to show a private market reaction in order <laughs> for it to uh, meet our collective approval, this is the system you'll create every time. So it's not just disaster capitalism. It's the same as Christmas capitalism or breakfast capitalism. It's just capitalism. So again, I'm sorry, I keep going back to the, so what, are, what, what can be done about this? I mean, we, we, we have the prospect of numerous cities that could face terrible disasters, climate disasters, in the coming decades. I mean, is there, you know, besides, I mean, obviously the, the pet thing is, is important, but it sounds like there's almost, we need some more s systemic kind of change. Uh, the, the, the easy part actually is the search and rescue and evacuation. Yeah. The governors get on there, boy, they be on all the morning shows. We evacuated 80 dogs yesterday and 80 people <laughs> out of uh, Terrebonne Parish. The hard part is recovery. And recovery is a living hell. I'm on my Zoom call this morning with some people down at St. James Parish. They've got volunteer students from Ohio 
and what other state there from Indiana mucking homes in St. James Parish? Now, today. Right now, today. And in New Orleans, we had people coming here for two to three years helping people clean their homes. As soon as the camera leave, the focus on the poor is gone. The parish get their money to give to their fire contractors. But can you believe in St. James Parish? Elderly poor people, my, uh, primarily, are still trying to clean out their house. That is today, okay? And it didn't get any better from Katrina to now to Gustav to Laura, it's a crying damn shame that the government at the local, the state, and the parish level, the parish, they might as well go hire six drunk men in the bar <laughs> than the parish governments we got in Louisiana. They are the worst I've ever seen. They all do things to paddle their own friends and they get reelected. And I know there might be a few exceptions, and I'll count them on one hand. <laughs> but our parish governments are, it, it's shameful what they don't do to try to help their own people. They're all about helping the business and getting jobs and the hell with the people in the, in the community. So uh, just real quickly, uh, uh, one more statement, then we're gonna, um, I'd like to have a little time for questions uh, from the audience. If, so if anybody has a question, if you just come up to the mic. That'd be helpful. Um, I'm sorry. Um, I just want to add uh, to that. Um, it's not just about recovery. It's about what are we doing to make things better for the next storm. This city right. is not doing enough. And what I find interesting is um, there's not even enough publicity on what people can do in their own homes. And I'm telling you, more could happen if people with homes either, I mean, there are things like gravel instead of, of lawn, cisterns in the back of, the, uh, of, of your house, street um, uh, uh, drains cleaned out, all sorts of what we think are little and local add up to a big change. And we should be doing those things ahead of the next storm instead of waiting to figure out how to recover from it. Oh, 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 I, I think we need um, to celebrate the people who inspire us. There's, there's so many negative things that go on after a disaster, so many crooks, so much incompetence that um, I, I, was, I found myself looking for inspiration, you know, for people who are kind of stepping up and I'm not trying to make the most of it, but, but kind of realizing it's, it's a tough situation, but there's some opportunities for improvement. So I was really inspired by all the church volunteers that came, not just the first spring break or the first summer, over and over and over again. I mean, I, I still get goosebumps and, get, you know, I'm overwhelmed you know, when I, when I um, kind of remember that generosity of people coming in. Young folks who were moving in from all over the country, urban planners, people who um, you know, were starting these charter schools, found a lot of inspiration from that. And from this immigrant community, I also found a lot of inspiration from the Vietnamese where they didn't wait for people to kind of come, they didn't wait for the cavalry to come, they knew they weren't. Uh, the, the rest of us thought that they were and that they were, the Vietnamese were right and I was wrong. Um, but the fact that they just kind of went ahead, moved forward, and started rebuilding their, their homes and their community, you know, right away also gave me a lot of inspiration. And I think that, that there's a lot to be said for maybe thinking a bit about immigration as sort of a, a way to revitalize the, the city, the state, and the country um, in other ways, too, that, you know, in, 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 under the eight years of the Trump administration, the number of refugees and other immigrants that we've allowed into the country has declined dramatically. It's a big problem in Louisiana where we're the only state in the deep south, us in Mississippi, we're losing population. All the other southern states, you know, people are flocking to them except for us. So we're, we're becoming old, um, we, you know, young people are moving away, and so if we did decide that we were going to, you know, um, embrace immigration, uh, these, you know, th these are people who are very, they're not 
just regular people from Vietnam or China or Ukraine or Afghanistan. These are the very ambitious people, you know, who are wanting to come to a, a new place and work a little harder, have some new ideas. They're young. They're, they're in, in early family building um, ages. We need this, you know, we need, we need it demographically, but also I think we would find a lot of inspiration from communities like the Vietnamese kind of figure out a way forward. <clears throat> oh, do we have a question? I'm sorry. Hi. Um, one of the requirements for immigrants to get assistance, well, one of the requirements for people to get assistance from the government is that they're U.S. citizens or permanent residents. What can we do about the immigrant community that is growing um, in New Orleans, Louisiana? I mean, it's nice to take lessons from resilience of, you know, documented and undocumented peoples, many of whom are taxpayers, um, but how can we do we have any lessons? How can we actually support those vulnerable? Thanks for asking that question. I, I, I found a lot of inspiration from a lot of the undocumented, illegal uh, Latinos who came in and did the work that nobody else wanted to do. I mean, it was um, they were they were a gift from heaven. You know, they, they worked so hard and um, the the work was so desperate and, and, and needed to to be done for cash. And it did break my heart to hear these stories about. They would, you know, often work for weeks and go unpaid, or they would become injured and, you know, not have have any protection. I think that we didn't really do right by a lot of a lot of the um, people who came in and did the dirty work to get the city back on on, on its feet. It's, it's a real problem. Thank you for bringing that up. Anybody else you want? Hi. So I came from the last talk, um, the last climate change talk where they talked about the challenges related to Plaquemines Parish and areas that would be outside of that 50-year levee wall that are currently outside of levee wall protection. How do these questions about recovery and flood insurance and community resilience, does that look different in communities in Plaquemines Parish and Terrebonne Parish, parishes like St. James that are still being mucked out? How does that conversation change when you look at building community resilience in areas that are realistically going to flood again in our lifetimes? Yeah, I think our governor is addressing this with a climate change task force uh, that is just scratch, scratching the top of it. We have to come up with a relocation plan, and it needs to be based on the 25 to 50 year. We're going to have to move away from the coast, and we might be able to save much in New Orleans, but every scientist I've read, with the exception of a few wackos, if you don't worry about why it's going to happen and argue over why it's going to happen, we're losing our coast and our ability to defend it. Now, we continue to put some money into like the Barataria Bay. We could put uh, levees around Laplace. The people in, uh, on the North Shore are going to need levees because when the water push up Lake Pontchartrain, it's going to go in all them subdivisions they built over there so they could drive their boats out to the lake. It's totally <laughs> stupid. But we're going to have to move away from the water. And we need to figure out how we take the New Orleans culture and move it, and the Gulf Coast culture, and move it away from the coast. But we've got the key points. 43% of U.S. exports go through the port of New Orleans. We need to hold on to that. How are we going to defend that? That's an economic driver for the nation. But I don't think right now, until your generation come up, and run for office, we're going to be about 50 years too late. We need a plan now that's workable to get people relocated. We cannot continue to rebuild Grand Island. It's over. It was a fishing camp in the first place after the Indians left, and we tried to make it a resident in a little Las Vegas. It's not going to work. You can't put enough sandbags out there to save it. You can't build the houses large enough because the levy, the water keep coming. But we keep putting money back in to restore places that are untenable. The same thing as South Potters Plaquemine Parish. We got issues there. We got to get them solved. And the other thing, we got 150 chemical plants between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, what we traditionally call Hurricane Alley. Uh, six of those refineries failed during IRA. 
drove the price of gas up for a few days in the states for four dollars. It didn't last long, but three, uh, four of those refineries didn't get rebuilt because of cost. So we got some serious infrastructure problem. We did the levy, good project, but we needed a project starting like that about every three years to protect critical infrastructure. And there are people smarter than I in these academic halls can figure that out, but we needed no kidding strategic plan, not figured out by people in office now, but people like you are going to be running the state in the next 10 years. Do you, do you think the fact that New Orleans was rebuilt after Katrina and that the city has in fact, I mean, I know it's a very different city, but that the population has gone back and is sort of working against that effort to try and plan ahead for well, I think inevitable. what New Orleans proved we could do it if there was a will of the people and the will of the nation to put throw enough money at it. But trust me, Terrebonne Paris not going to get that. Plymouth Paris, Lake Charles didn't get it. It's got it because of the brand of New Orleans. My favorite city in the world is right damn here. But no other place in Louisiana is going to get the resources New Orleans got uh, after the recovery. It's not going to happen because the rest of the people in Washington, they look at their coastline as just a matter of time before we have to move out. But we need to plan it now because we need those plants. They produce stuff we use, but we have to make them pollution neutral, if you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> we got to get rid of the greenhouse gas, and we got to stop leaving abandoned pipelines along the coast that's going to destroy the coast even more. We can do this, but I think the governor's plan uh, is okay, but it's not, it won't get resources. There are at least 10 bills in the legislature to negate the governor's recommendation on climate change. One of them said, nowhere in Louisiana can you control greenhouse gas. That's a bill that a senator has put into, uh, that they're going to read next week or week after. So we're our own worst enemy because we're trying to protect fossil fuel, but we've got to move the people away from the coast. And we're not good at that. We don't want to think about that. That is for the next generation to think about. But we need to figure out who's going to be in government 25 years from now and have them develop that plan now. Because the current idiots we got, they're not going to do it. <laughs> Well, we have just run out of time, and I think that's a great place to end. Well, <laughs>